I just was one of those nature kids. You know, I was born with this passion. You know, I'd gotten out of college. I was radical, I was excited about life, had a BA degree in art. I was totally unemployable. So I thought, what could I do if I wanted to explore up into Canada? We were camping out and I kept looking around and there was snow-capped mountains all around me. So I started climbing up this mountain and it was like the earth and the sky were one. So I started just drawing pictures of that. It was, it was awesome. So I went down off that ridge, and as soon as I got into the spruce and fir trees, all of a sudden, <laughs> this big bird flew up. It was like a grouse, but it wasn't like any grouse I'd ever seen before. I pulled my sketchbook out, and I started sketching this bird. Then that bird flew away, and I thought, holy cow, I'm a wildlife artist. Did National Geographic hire me? Well, not exactly. I climbed up the mountain and started doing it. And I realized right then, if I wanted to do something, was not wait for validation, not wait for a job, but just go for it with passion, with integrity, with humility, determination. And it was probably 10 or 15 years later, I was talking to a Native American, and he asked me if I'd ever seen a spruce grouse. I said, why do you ask? He says, well, you know, we consider spruce grouse to be a messenger bird. When it comes around, you might pay attention because often it brings an important message. And I thought, yeah, I think I know what we're talking about. And you know, in some ways, that kind of influenced my life. And I've been living in Western North Carolina for probably the last 30 years. What attracted to me here was the cultural integrity. Basically, many people who have a deep relationship with the land some of my best teachers have been traditional Appalachian folks and Native Americans and just broadened whatever book learning I could ever get. And there was a story about the old timers sitting around the store, you know, up on one of these back roads over here, sitting around the store saying, yep, so old Zeke, he is out there plowing with his mule. Yep, had his hippie with him. <laughs> I think I know who they're talking about. Because <laughs> I certainly have spent my time following the footprints of wise old timers, you know. Our drinking water, we only drink a gallon or two a day. And there's a little spring that's a little bit below the house. So we just go and fetch it. In some ways, that's sort of a pleasant routine. There you go. Fresh, mature spring water right out of the mountain. We have running water to the house, but it's creek water. And well, the creek does have a little waterfall. And there's a little catchment basin that catches the water. It runs through a couple of the settling tanks. Then it, we have a buried pipe all the way to the house. It's clean water, but we don't drink that just because you never know who waded through it the night before. But what that does, that gives us incredible water pressure. So even during a drought, Yana can water the garden and keep an irrigation system going. It's a nice little scene. Thank goodness my wife Yana has a passion for gardening. All right. Looks like we're getting a pretty good pepper year this year. Yeah, good peppers, man. They are so pretty. This is great. I'm trying to keep these tied up. So this is the time of year when everything is coming in. So our main job now is to celebrate the harvest. Yeah, let's eat one fresh. So we eat as much fresh as we can. We try to can it, we try to dry it, we try to freeze it, so we have enough to last us all winter. Yana is so good about that. She actually takes a tally of how much we eat during a normal year, and then she'll usually preserve about one and a half times, just in case the next year doesn't produce real well. Plants, they have some of the same struggles that all of us have. How do you get along in this world? How do you protect yourself from invasive things? How do you protect yourself from pests? Often the plants that are most nutritious have something to keep things from eating them. These are stinging nettles. The reason they call them stinging nettles is because they have little tiny hairs. They actually inject you with formic acid. That's the same thing that an ant stings you with. Sometimes the mountain people call it seven minute itch because it kind of kind of gets on you for about seven minutes, but it's usually not much of a problem after that. My sweet wife, Yana, she likes to use it as a nerve tonic. If she's feeling a little carpal syndrome, she'll actually apply some of that to her hands. So even though this plant will sting you when it's fresh and live, 
If you pick it carefully, then you can take it in, drop it into boiling water, let it simmer for just a couple of minutes, and it'll turn it into a delicious vegetable. It's one of the most nutritious plants that we mm. have here in the garden. They're good. We're all part of this miracle of creation. And sometimes I think that my desire to know about all these creatures is part of wanting to know myself. You know, the favorite line my dad used to say, that boy knows what's under every rock between here and town. And, and I still turn over rocks and, you know, I'm still looking for critters, but I'm also looking for the stories that connect those critters, the stories that connect those critters to us. And so, I guess part of my passion has been trying to find more points of contact. Look what's here on this little persimmon tree. This is a hickory horned devil caterpillar. This is one of our most amazing caterpillars. And look at the horns on this little devil. They're absolutely harmless, but they're probably one of our most extraordinary caterpillars. And this one's only about half grown. When they're full grown, they're almost six inches long. What a critter. It'll turn into a great big moth. My friend Scott Gooch always says, everything's got its weak point, its vulnerable points. You grab the crab from behind, and you can, you can hold it safely. You hold the rattlesnake behind his head, you can hold it safely. Hold a possum by the tail, you can hold it safely. Yeah, look at this rascal. Ain't she a beauty? Let's see. Yep, she. <laughs> you know how I can tell? Look at that, she's got a pouch. Our only marsupial in North America has a pouch like a kangaroo. And look at this. Very few creatures in the world that have opposable thumbs, humans and possums. You know, humans, we've used our opposable thumbs to build great civilizations. Possums, they've been using theirs just to hold on, and they have been holding on for a long time. The first little mammals that showed up after the age of dinosaurs were almost identical to our modern possums. We maybe let you get back home. Come on, take care there, little gal. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I can't stand those old possums. Some scientists did some stomach analysis studies, and they found out that in some areas, half of their diet is copperheads. I mean, you like copperheads? Oh, look at this beauty. Oh, my. This is a black rat snake. Sometimes people in Carolina, they call these king snakes. These are kind of the arboreal snakes. They really like to climb around. They're the ones that you'll find sometimes in your attic or in your barn. Well, they call them rat snakes because they love rats. Oh, what a beauty. You know, people say snakes are aggressive. They're very rarely aggressive. They're defensive sometimes. And sometimes they get really scared and they'll bite at you and he'll get his freedom here soon enough. All right, now we're gonna do the old snake charmer trick. Isn't that incredible, the muscular control of a beast like that? Look at that. Look at how much of his body is straight up. Looks like it's been well fed, which is of course good news, because with all the voles and things in our garden, we are so glad to have a few of these big fat snakes around. You know, some people say, this is like this little Eden here with all your gardens and ponds and swamps and things like that. But well, you have to realize that Eden is everywhere. If we can just sort of tweak our eye, open our heart and realize that even if it's a suburban backyard, nature just wants to be a part of our lives since we are a part of nature. such an honor that people actually want to hear what I have to say, and I'm just so lucky that people think that's the value. Well, you know, we all tell stories. When I ask you what you did today, you're basically composing a narrative. That's how we make sense of our lives. There was the story about the African tribe, and some missionaries brought them over a TV for the first couple of weeks. The whole village all gathered together, and they just watched that TV and they watch that thing. And then after about a couple of weeks, 
they started going back to the village storyteller. This is a Taoist story, story from Asia, about the guy that was chased by the tiger. And they asked him, they said, doesn't the TV know more stories than your storyteller? And they said, yeah, it does, but the storyteller knows us. He was running for all he was worth. There was no tree he could climb. It was either the tiger or the cliff. He chose the cliff. He jumped off of that cliff, and as luck would have it, he caught that vine. And he's hanging on that vine, and he looked up, and he saw that tiger looking over the edge of that cliff. And he thought, oh, I'm safe from that tiger. All I have to do is lower myself down this vine. He looked down below. There was another tiger pacing back and forth. He was trying to figure out what to do, and he noticed the vine was just up out of his reach, stretched tight over a little rock ledge. And up on that ledge, and just up out of his reach, he saw some movement. There was a little mouse up there, a little light-colored mouse. That mouse was as light as the day. That little mouse came up, started nibbling on that vine. And that little mouse went in, and a little another mouse came out, a little dark mouse, dark as the night. That little dark mouse started chewing on that vine. That vine kept getting thinner. That little dark mouse went in, and the light mouse came out. Dark mouse went in, and they kept taking turns, the light and the dark, and the light and the dark. And the vine kept getting thinner and thinner, and he was trying to think, what do I do now? And he looked, and growing out of that cliff was a strawberry, a perfectly ripe strawberry. He reached out, he grabbed that strawberry, and he ate that strawberry. And he enjoyed that strawberry, and he gave thanks. And the Taoists say that's the end of that story. And that story, that story is about our life about how we're just hanging by that little thread of life and the main thing we can be doing while that thread gets thinner as the day and the night pass is enjoy our strawberries and give thanks.